Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about my experience last semester. Actually, like I taught this class one time before, so I already had most of the material already. So that was actually like something to take away is that when you try to teach your course through, I think, through a shared hybrid model, you it's better to redesign it once you have something ready. And for me, it was an easy transition in particular because I actually already teach out of slides, and then that was easy to actually integrate. So I will show you more as I go. Um, so this um, is actually under the LACO, the LIBARS Consortium for Online Learning. It's 11 uh, LIBARS colleges across the country. And in particular, we are under the upper level math and stats project. So this is a pilot uh, project that we're trying to share classes to supplement each of the campuses and still keep the small uh, LIBARS flavor. So the pilot study was two year study and it was um, this year and last year. And I taught my uh, Vassar's Math 347 Bayesian Statistics last fall, and I had 16 Vassar students, so it's an upper level course, 300 level. Um, it's 16 Vassar students, um, and then we started with four remote students, but gradually only uh, dropped down to only one uh, remote student from Swarthmore. But nevertheless, I mean, once you have, as long as you have one, things have to change and things have to adapt for that particular person. So, like, I was secretly hoping that, oh, I can take five, ten, because I already made all of that work. And I would talk to you a little bit about like the limitation with my only one-time experience, especially only one remote student. Okay. And, um, and in the same project, we have two other mathematic courses uh, being implemented in the sl uh, same flavor, one from Williams uh, College and another one is from Pomona. Uh, so for here, um, I want to share two main things. One is how I make the course work, the course mechanics. And then in particular, I want to uh, talk about how to create and foster an online learning community. I want to share my experiences and some challenges that I would like to discuss um, and hear some feedback as how you would deal with these um, issues. Uh, so for course mechanics, so I provide synchronized and asynchronized access to the students. So in particular, I use a software called Zoom. So it's a video conferencing software. Um, Vassar has an institutional account. I think actually a lot of uh, campuses have institutional accounts, so it should be uh, pretty available. And that means not only you can start your meetings, like actually students can actually like uh, log in and talk to each other if needed. Um, so for me, um, I usually just start the lecture in the classroom with the desktop and then with, the, with this uh, interface and then I start it. Uh, the desktop will have a video capturing, like a camera capturing like the entire classroom and then I join the course with my iPad using the same software like the app on the iPad and then I take control over. Uh, later I will see how I do it. But anyway, so this is how to give them uh, the synchronized uh, access because students actually using the same Zoom meeting ID that can join the class real time for remote students. And then the unsynchronized version is I just record it through the same software and then upload it to uh, YouTube, uh, a playlist to YouTube. All right, um, so pretty much um, these are what I usually need, iPad Pro, Apple Pencil, and the laptop. So this is my... Uh, equipment when I go to, uh, go to class. So mainly, so I was describing, I use the desktop in the classroom to start, but I really want to use um, an iPad or something that I can write on, because immediately I would need to bring up my slides to, to talk about the material. So usually I use Google Drive, and then you can use, I think um, the Zoom software can also allow you to use Dropbox as well. They have multiple like options that you want to uh, you want to go. So pretty much I take control <coughs> using uh, the iPad and then the Apple Pencil is for me to write on the slides. I will show you some of the screencast later, uh, screenshot later. And then um, also, yeah, mostly just write and then trying to point and then highlight. And then for a laptop, because uh, I teach a statistics course, we usually do a lot of like our programming or any other kind of software programming that you need to use. So when that happens, I take control. So I, okay, so usually I have like three different devices. I'm joining the <laughs> courses. And then, uh, so when I need to uh, do for our demonstration, I t like take control, share like, uh, I think, yeah, screen. share your screen uh, to your laptop. And then I take control so I can show like the actual programming uh, material um, on my laptop. But pretty much like things move pretty, pretty okay, I would say like the technology, like as long as internet, it's pretty stable. I think all of the transition is smooth. 
All right, uh, so just some screenshots. Uh, so these are the lecture slides. So this is just a screenshot of the YouTube video that I had later. So this was introduction. You can see I started with more students because you can see some other student like, like zoom in real time. And later they drop, but that's okay. Um, so this is a demo of how I can write on the slides. So this is just still within Zoom. I just bring, uh, so this is not so much a slides like a document, but I was trying to, so I wrote out this material, which I usually provide in a traditional classroom, like course anyway, but then like in the lecture, I use my uh, Apple Pencil to like highlight and then do some more um, demonstration if needed. And one thing I actually want to add here is later when I asked about students like how this was working, there were minor issue with the Zoom, maybe it's about Zoom, maybe it's about something else, is that there would be like a half second lag when I write and when I talk. Yeah, so that would be something, um, I guess we don't know exactly how to fix it in real time, but when I talk to my ACS people on campus, they say, and they actually watch those videos, they say, like your voice is not really captured well enough, so what we're gonna do next time is they're gonna have an additional device just to record, and then later after afterwards, like when they combine and then trying to make things. So that aspect, I think, like the half second black will be solved over there, but in real time, it's still a problem. Like students just sit there. I actually never know because I just sit there, and students are there. The screen is behind me, and they were just looking at it. I just. Mm. So yeah, you never know. So that kind of stuff is kind of, um, I don't know, like we don't know yet how to uh, fix it, but still overall, like just the Zoom software, everything works really well for, for that purpose, I think. So this is when I can write all the slides. Another um, function that Zoom has is you can bring a whiteboard. So that's like, oh, I was talking using slides, and all of a sudden, oh, let's just forget about what I wrote before. Let's just start from scratch, how you can do it. So that's a whiteboard option, so you can just like the option there, you just click it, and then it's a whiteboard. So this is a screenshot of like a video that I made later actually to re recap what we talked about in class, like work through a particular um, exercise um, or like particular example from scratch. So I think for that, Zoom is really useful. And this last one is an R demo. Okay, so this is when I, earlier I was talking about, oh, I need to use my software, I want to show how to code it. So it's, it's very easy because in, like, in a usual stats course, we do that in class anyway. But then within Zoom or many other software, I think once you join the lecture um, using your laptop, it's pretty easy to do that. And then you can make videos about it too. So this is actually, yeah, this is a shorter video you can see over here. So usual lectures are like 75 minutes long. Yeah, but anyway, after class sometimes, sometimes or after class to recap, sometimes it's for Let's see, uh, like students come to office hour for the same questions, blah, 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 blah. So I just ended up like make a five minutes video. Yeah, some hint for the problem, the problem from homework. That's useful. And then especially at the beginning for the students come in with varying degrees of programming skills. So that was helpful for me, I think, when, when I noticed something that is very common or some kind of ways to write a particular function in the program language that you use, making a video is actually really useful. Because otherwise what you do, you just sit in the classroom, I demo, I zoom this in, and then people can see it. But usually, like, I think it's better for students to have these shorter videos that they can re-watch multiple times and then just like recap the particular part that they don't get. So that part, I think, is very useful. So for this part, uh, for this use of not only just like our demonstration, but also just some kind of exercise going, like redoing some of the exercises, I do in my other courses too because I noticed that, oh, students find it actually more useful, and then you will notice if certainly towards the end of the final, like, students come in to ask the same questions, blah, blah, blah. So that kind of like building up a rep repository for yourself, I think that's pretty useful too. So that's a capture of your laptop screen? Yes, point. yeah. And so you have the ability, you started out on your iPad, and then hit some button that switched yeah, the, so, from right. the, the iPad to yeah, the laptop. Yeah, exactly, so you can share screen. Yeah, so I started the course on the desktop, mm -hmm. and then I joined, so there's an ID, and then like, Zoom, like meeting ID, and then I joined using my iPad. Uh -huh. You can also join using a laptop, and then you can, so the control say, say start it from the desktop, but then you can start sharing screen, like, oh, I now let the other device to take control. Got it. Yeah, so that's how, but this one in particular, I think I made it afterwards, just a shorter video for students to rewatch then yeah, you do all kinds of things. Usually I have multiple devices just to, uh -huh. just to make it um, better, I think, more, more comfortable. 
All right, so uh, this is mostly like how the mechanics works. Uh, but I do want to share a few things in particular because I told you that I had one remote student. How am I going to involve this particular student? We started earlier uh, with four, and then at that time, I think two are from the same college, the other two are from different colleges. So there's three, uh, three different colleges, four students, and then how to, how to make them not only talk to each other, talk to me, <coughs> but also like how can I engage them to the uh, local students? Because if you think about the ratio, it started with 16 to 4, and they ended up with 16 to 1. And then that one particular student. So earlier I was saying at the uh, introductory that I wish I had more, not only because I already created the material for some kind of remote access, but also because just, you just have one student there, like how are you gonna pair up, pair up that student with who, you, like in the end, I, like, I had to deliver a select like nice students, like I mean nice kind students who are, who are willing to go beyond and just like go ahead like to do some kind of connection to people actually not on campus. So that kind of stuff I would wish hopefully next time when I do it like there will be more. So either I will be able to like group students like remote students together or if there is a critical mass over there we can actually have this cross um, exchange between like a couple of remote students and a couple of uh, local students. So that's something that I think really need to have a good sizes to, to make sure that can work out. Anyway, so uh, there are a few things that I tried in order to create and foster this online learning community. So I use Moodle, we use Moodle Ambassador. And one thing I got uh, advice actually from Jennifer, because um, in September, like first few weeks, I came down uh, to the Trico area to visit the two local, like two remote students, but local students here to give a lecture just to get to know them. Uh, so then I got the chance to talk to uh, the Bring More uh, group and then uh, they were telling me, yeah, you should do like some kind of self-introduction post on Moodle. So I did that kind of like a little bit too late because that was like three, already three weeks in. But then later some people were telling me, yeah, think about it. Like you, so when I did it, I just asked them to write a few sentences about themselves, blah, blah, blah. And then <coughs> later people suggested, how about like ask them to make like intro, introduction videos. Like you can see the face, you can hear the voice, that kind of stuff. So next time I would do it, but then I still got the chance during the semester towards the end uh, to ask students to make project intro videos, which is two minutes videos. It's a so we have a poster session at the end, but we pretty much just use like lecture, uh, use uh, PowerPoint slides, slides, that kind of stuff. So we had a poster as the last uh, lecture, but I asked each project, like maybe one student, maybe two students on the same project to make a two minute intro videos, just like a pitch talk about their, their project. So that I did um, during the semester towards the end. This is a screenshot of one example, and I <coughs> asked them to post them, post all of the videos on Moodle before they come to the poster session. So I think that helps. So here I wrote useful for the presenters. So now they know. So first of all, very, pretty much everyone was new to poster <coughs> session in a sense that, oh, I'm, I know about like giving a presentations for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, but what does it mean to have a poster session? So I explained them multiple times. This is not, it's not fancy. You don't worry about it. It's really easy. Anyway, so but I, tur I think this turns out to be really useful for them to know that what they actually want to talk about. And in particular, so this is a two minute pitch talk. And then for a one on one or one on uh, several, uh, poster session uh, discussions, you still have to like be very succinct and try to get the gist out. So I think that's useful for the presenters, useful for the audience. For me, um, it turns out because I ask them to watch every video before you come, and then I think that helps them to to decide during the poster session where they're gonna go. Okay. So um, however, I still find it hard to. <coughs> I didn't didn't even try back then because I just want to make this right, like just to make everything available, but I found uh, very little or pretty much like no online interaction on that. So here people can post, like they can make one discussion topic and post their videos, but I guess I could have asked them, like people, yeah, make, a, make a comment before you come. You really need to require that. So this, all of this, two other examples I would give, really requires student accountability. And then you have to, in a way, you really have to like require, otherwise you don't get the credit, that kind of stuff. So I didn't learn it. I think Jennifer told me, oh, undergrads, you have to do that for them, otherwise they're never going to do uh, what you hope they're going to do. Uh, but anyway, so I think that's a um, limitation and something actually um, occurred in the other two examples too. So this, the second example is uh, we, we were reading um, 
like not really complicated, but still like academic research paper as part of uh, like discussing a particular topic is Gibbs sampler in Bayesian uh, Monte Carlo Mark of Chain Monte Carlo. Anyway, so it's um, it's not a really difficult uh, paper in particular. Uh, they design a sequence of really nice simulation studies that is actually accessible to the students. Uh, so I did this before when I taught the course not online. And I did it again, uh, but then this time um, I had um, six discussion questions, and then I post each question. Set. So I post a document about the questions, of course, and then in the discussion board function on Moodle, I created like one discussion topic for responses to to each questions. And this here, I learned that oh, I really need to require students to make response before you come, and then that helped, I think. So because you give students accountability, uh, I can see a higher level engagement because you can see, it's hard to see, but like you can see the replies over here. You can see certain questions got, like, got more attention than the other ones. Students like to discuss those more. Um, but as you can see, so this is my picture. And then no extra questions actually being posted by the students. So I think it's still like a little bit passive. It's just like a, very much like a homework question type of stuff. I list the six questions please answer. And then I think it's still hard, I think, to, to really get the students to, to ask more questions that may have. Maybe miraculously all of the six questions are already cover everything, but I'm sure there are things that I don't understand. And there are certain things I don't fully understand from the paper either. So there's one, actually one this uh, extra discussion topic that we, because, so, so in class we discuss all of the questions again. And I got to read this before, before the discussion. But anyway, during the first time of discussion, we realized there's two things that we didn't understand from the paper. I didn't understand, nobody really picked up. So I said, okay, let's go back. Next time, before we meet again, please make, so I initiate this topic, and then you can see actually a lot of students make comments on that, because now we have much more narrowed down to that particular two questions that we don't, we all don't understand and then um, get, um, get the chance to do that. And uh, the last example I want to uh, give um, is, so um, in a traditional course, you probably just will invite your um, collaborators or invite your colleagues on campus to give a guest or a lecture. But then because now things are moving like semi-online, we get a chance to make guest introductory videos instead of just like them coming here physically. So, I have a colleague at Vassar uh, who is in kind of a science program, and he's uh, like applied Bayesian person pretty much. So he does a lot of research um, using Bayesian methods. So uh, in particular, a particular type of method. So before we started that topic, um, I thought about, okay, how about asking my um, colleague to do a video for us? So that it was like a half semester progress, to be honest. Like we had to meet like every other week just to discuss, because we use different languages. Like they, they, they never talk about like the details of the derivations or why things work, they just talk about applications. And for me, even between me and him, we have different languages. And then I have to like, we have to talk about like to get a common understanding, but also later I sort of have to monitor like the stuff that he uses and the stuff that he references, because I want to make it more um, tailored for my students. So, but that was a really interesting experience. But anyway, so in the end, we get a 20 minutes introductory lecture for a particular topic. Uh, so again, because I require students to watch, watch it and then make comments and stuff, so you can see a higher uh, level engagement because of the accountability. Again, uh, no discussion topics started by the students, which I, I really need to figure out how, if in the future I can do it. And uh, one more thing I tried over here, because so around this time during the semester, we're introducing a new, I'm also new to that, I was new to that, a particular programming package that can do all of the analysis for you. So usually, I mean, as an academic person, we usually just code it up by yourself. But then to really make it more approachable to practitioners, there are, out, there are packages out there. So I started to learn and introduce that to the course. And then I think around this time, I actually had concerns or things that I couldn't solve. So I post those questions and share with this uh, with the class. And I think uh, students actually are pretty pretty active to help me out and help everybody out. So, so I think like here and earlier, like maybe like just put yourself out there. I don't know any, like I don't know everything. We are learning together. And I think that's one way I can think of to, to get the learning community 
a little bit more uh, friendly and then less intimidating for, for a lot of students. Yeah, okay. I think I'm, yeah, so um, yeah, we're gonna wait for the Thank lesson. Thank you yeah. so much, Mike.